Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Sophia Paris. I'm a professor in the political science department at Boston University. And uh, our guest today is Paolo Graziano from the University of Padua and Sciences Po in Paris, who is going to be speaking on neo-populism and the challenges to democracy. And we would like to thank the Center for the Study of Europe at Boston University for making this possible. Thank you. Well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sophia, for having me here. Thank you all for uh, being in the room. Uh, I'm uh, personally uh, from Padova, actually, and from Milano, for those who are familiar with uh, Italy. How many of you have been to Italy? Yes, a couple. Oh, more than a couple, actually. Many of you. So anyway, it's northern part of Italy. Uh, and I've been teaching for some years at Bocconi University, uh, that some of you know. And I heard that there was a former Bocconi student. Uh, what, what did you study in Bocconi? I am a history student, third year, um, political science. Right, okay. So, but we, we didn't meet because uh, I, I'm teaching at the graduate level. So, no, yeah. not yet. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, I'm, I, I still actually do uh, teach public policy analysis in Bocconi, but I'm primarily. Uh, uh, affiliated to Padova, where I uh, am professor of political science and policy analysis, and I'm also affiliated to a number of centers, but one of the most important ones uh, for my studies, which uh, uh, are European studies and populism, as I, I will say in a few seconds, uh, is Sciences Po Paris. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, today with you is just uh, take you uh, on a tour, uh, which will be a neo-populist tour, as I will label it. Uh, we will try to uh, understand uh, why, first of all, you don't see populism, but you see neo-populism. Some could be puzzled by the fact that I'm not simply using the term that everybody else uses, or many use, uh, which is uh, populism. I'll tell you why I think that we should uh, uh, think rather in neo-populist terms, that is not populism, that is uh, a phenomenon that we had many years ago, and uh, today's phenomenon is quite different. But also, we will try to understand how, since this is a democracy class, a class looking at democracies and the varieties of democracies, we'll focus on liberal democracy, we'll focus on current liberal democracies. Uh, but we'll also take a look more theoretically and try to understand um, how uh, neo-populist uh, policymaking, not only neo-populist parties, but also parties that actually then uh, manage to uh, reach uh, the governmental threshold how they may challenge the functioning of democracy. So you all know what a democracy is. Uh, you may not all know what populism is. But before I start, let me ask you, since populism has become such uh, uh, an important word, uh, what would you associate to populism? How would you define populism if you have any idea? Yeah, your name? Uh, my name is Reese. Reese? For sure. First of all, as we will see, there's a main core, which uh, is an antagonistic relationship between the people. We'll see what the people means, more specifically, and the elite. And we'll also see what the elite may mean, more specifically. OK, then we'll see that at the heart of populism, we do have this antagonistic relationship. But first of all, let us uh, say that uh, populism has become uh, a very, very, maybe too fashionable term. Uh, why too fashionable? Because quite often it is used in uh, a very broad manner. Now, I'm sure you've heard of Giovanni Sartori uh, in your studies. And one of uh, the uh, groundbreaking articles that Sartori wrote many years ago was about concept stretching. That is, misformation of concepts and making concepts that are stretched too much. If populism is not well defined, Everything may uh, turn to be populism. So we have to be very careful with this. And quite often in uh, the journalistic debates on the media, uh, you hear uh, that populism is this, that populism is that. But quite often, you do not really understand what are the distinctive features of the phenomenon. For this reason, we'll try to uh, go uh, into uh, this uh, uh, hour long or roughly hour long journey and try to understand if we can uh, un underline some specific traits 
of populism in order to understand what populism is and what it may not be. Knowing that not only it's a buzzword and it has been very fashionable, but also we have been witnessing a number of political phenomena that actually can be, we'll see why, can be defined as neo-populist phenomena. <coughs> this is why it's not simply fashion. It's not simply something that has become fashionable and has no analytical relevance. In my view, it's very relevant analytically, but we have to make sure that we take uh, a good uh, a look at populism without mixing apples and pears. Again, you may be surprised by this metaphor, but again, it's not totally speaking, and it's not myself. Comparison has to be done, making sure that you're comparing the right uh, uh, topics or the right <coughs> phenomena in order not to make uh, the existence of something that does not exist in reality uh, that could be the dog cat. This is once again Sartori saying if you mix cats and dogs, then you have the cangato, which is the dog cat that actually does not exist. So we have to make sure that as political scientists, we uh, take uh, appropriate uh, uh, analytical stand and differentiate ourselves from historians and political philosophers that has actually have worked on the concept and on the phenomena for a number of years, in particular historians. Why is it, we'll say more in a, in a few minutes, but why is it that in my view we should not talk about populism today? Because populism is the People's Party in the late 19th century in the US. Populism is the populist movement in Russia in the second half of the 19th century. It's something that's developed, and I think we can go uh, to uh, the other slide, it developed in uh, a number of ways that are very uh, uh, different than uh, the uh, ways through which neo-populism developed to date. But before we, we get to uh, more details on this difference, let me just say how populism has been defined in the current literature. And the definition is of populism by contemporary scholars, uh, because again, no, not many scholars do differentiate between populism and neo-populism. I hope that at the end of this talk, you at least ponder the idea of actually using neo-populism and not populism anymore. But since the literature has been using, the academic literature has been using populism as a key concept, let's see what uh, has been said in terms of definitions. One, uh, the first definition is uh, uh, the so-called ideational approach to populism. It's a definition that is centered on an ideology, the ideological traits. And the, the reading is uh, that populism has a very thin-centered ideology in terms uh, of uh, the uh, number of attributes that the ideology has, and centered because it has a very simple nucleus. And this nucleus is exactly, as we will see, the antagonistic relationship between the people and the elite. As a matter of fact, I think we can go to the following slide and just provide a further uh, um, uh, focus on the thin-centered ideology. The people are at the heart of the reading. Populism, it's supporting the people against the elite. And the uh, point of departure is that the people have been uh, uh, in conflict with the elite, and the elite has always been winning, and the elite is corrupt. Not only it's an elite, but it's also is corrupt by definition, whereas the people, by definition, is pure. The people is made up of those who are hardworking, who are uh, uh, careful in uh, how they spend money because they do not have much money, and they're typically somehow exploited by the elites in different ways. This antagonistic relationship is at the heart uh, of uh, the uh, political uh, movements that we label as populists that have, at the end of the day, only one very key limited element in their ideology, which is Let's support, defend the people against the elite. In antagonistic relationship, we take the people's stand, and we want to somehow get rid of the elite. If we take another uh, line of the literature that is much more interested in the communication style of uh, uh, populists, uh, here we have a populist style which is based on a very specific reference. And we will not spend that much time on this, but let me just remind you of one of the classic uh, uh, rhetorical uh, uh, moves uh, of Trump. What does Trump typically do in his speeches? He starts out by saying initially that there's a big problem, there's a, a, uh, 
crisis, we'll talk about the crisis in a few minutes, there's uh, a big issue that has to be uh, uh, solved. The second step in this uh, rhetoric is something has to be done now, urgently. There's the urgency of doing something in order to avoid that the crisis will uh, kill us all. And then the third and final step is I'm here for you. I'm the leader that will allow you to get out of the crisis and something has to be done now, I'm here exactly for you. It's a very simplistic communication style that is aimed at emphasizing the critical moment on the one hand and aimed at uh, emphasizing the uh, capacities of the leader to solve the problem. And the leader is the only one that can actually solve the problem for the people. And finally, uh, another uh, definition or uh, approach that has been translated into a definition of populism uh, re looks at the political strategy, and in particular at the construction of political parties that are made uh, having at the center one leader. The party completely disappears. Now, this is not very surprising for American students or scholars, because as we know, political parties in the US are much weaker than, historically speaking, the political parties have been in Europe. But for Europe, and Europe is going to be our focus, this is uh, quite new, not entirely new. I will not go too much into the details, but it's uh, somehow uh, a further emphasis on the leader in a period when leaders, political leaders, have become increasingly relevant, but have actually not been entirely identified with the uh, political uh, movement or the political party that currently uh, the uh, neo-populist or populist uh, leaders actually do want to identify. So if we take these three different definitions, the first, of course, is the one that gives us, um, if you wish, uh, the uh, most important elements that we will look at what you want to define if a political party is populist or not. But then, also, the other elements are important in order to understand how and why neo-populist or populist parties have been so successful. Because if we had a non-successful story here, we could just finish up here, go and have a coffee and say, this is it. But this is only the point of departure, because as a matter of fact, we had a, a populist wave throughout the world, not only uh, the democratic world, as we will see. And this has somehow changed, in my view, the way through which politics is currently done. One of the first empirical studies that we will not have time to look into, that I conducted some, year ago, some years ago on Italy, was trying to trace the intensity of populist traits in Italian parties between 2004 and 2000, 2009 and 2000, and 2004 and 2014. What did I did, together with a colleague, Manuela Cagliani at the Scuola Normale Superiore, we looked at the uh, electoral manifestos, uh, European elections electoral manifestos, 2004, 2009, 2014, and we had a code book trying to understand how the manifestos were crafted, focusing on uh, a number of keywords that we would have expected to find if the parties were to be considered neo-populist. And that, what we did find, we found that not only some parties that were already populist in 2004 maintained their populist traits. One and for all, Silvio Berlusconi and Forza Italia. Some of you may have no idea of who he is. We will not have maybe that much time to go into the details. But uh, Italy is particularly interesting because it has been seen as a laboratory of populism. Well, Silvio Berlusconi was one of the first politicians in early 90s, more specifically in 1994, to become uh, the first uh, neo-populist prime minister uh, in Italy, and then having a legacy that is currently actually still uh, still ongoing. So why am I, am I looking at saying this? That I'm saying this because between 2004 and 2014, not only the usual suspects maintained their populist traits, but also many other parties went in a neo-populist direction, including parties on the left, quote unquote. The only party that had no traits of neo-populism was the uh, party that wanted to refound communism. Again, we don't have time to go into the detail, details. Partito della Rifondazione Comunista. And it was not surprising, because just like in Greece, if you look at the Communist Party, they're very old style. They're very oriented into uh, ideology, which is not thin-centered. It's very elaborate. It's uh, uh, an ideology which 
uh, is very well structured. Well, in Italy, all the other parties, though, went into a new populist direction. And this is just to mention Italy, but we have, and I'll cite uh, a, few, uh, um, a few websites and a few studies, uh, we have many uh, uh, other uh, observations, many other scholars that have gone in the same direction. So, oh. yeah, sorry, just to, to, to end this up. Well, we are also focusing on, therefore, not only the definition, but on the reasons and how populism, or populism success and how populism became successful. And therefore, we need also to keep into consideration the fact that crises have been mobilized by populist leaders in order to make the arguments much more powerful. Without crises or without emphasizing critical moments, it would be very difficult for neo-populist leaders to play also their rhetorical game. Rhetorical game. Social media have been particularly important in the communication style. No need to uh, remind you about how our life has been changed. Maybe you didn't see the change. We, uh, we did see the change uh, once uh, the uh, uh, personal computer first and then social media have been introduced and all the social media devices that uh, we typically have today. Not only Facebook, which is for oldies today, but TikTok and many other uh, examples that you have uh, on uh, uh, your mobile phone and use on a daily uh, basis, on an hourly basis. Finally, political leadership is also another issue that we will not have time to uh, expand on today. But if we want to understand the game, the populist game, we need also to see how political entrepreneurship has been mobilized and what have been the styles of political leaderships that have, for example, allowed Silvio Berlusconi to become successful for a long while, but then not to be successful anymore. Or uh, currently the prime minister of Italian uh, um, uh, government, Giorgia Meloni, become extremely successful, becoming prime minister in 10 years. It's a story that we will not have time to tell in detail, but has lots to do also with political leadership. Once we say, that neopopulism is, first of all, an antagonistic relationship, is viewing politically an antagonistic relationship between the people and the elite. We're saying something very clear, but at the same time very vague. Because we do not have an idea of what the people is, nor do we have an idea of what the elite may be. And this is one of the points that, have, um, that has not been that often uh, underlined in the literature, in my view. Uh, because you take the definition of uh, a populist party and you, you know that the populist, the party can be seen as populist and then you go with the regression analysis and try to understand what are the determinants of neo-populist thought. In my view, we, and together with others, maybe not too, uh, many others, but others for sure, uh, it's very important that we make sure that we understand what kind of populism or neo-populism we're talking about because not all populisms are the same. There's not only one populist phenomenon there are various populist phenomena that have different meanings and have different accents with reference to the way through which the people is defined. People as a unitary set of individuals linked by sovereignty goals. I mean, Israel studying, uh, coming from uh, Sciences Po originally, but now not working at Sciences Po anymore, they actually were uh, looking at the ways through which the people may be defined. This is a study that was conducted in 2000 in the year 2000, end of 90s, early 2000s. And here we have three, we, we could uh, also expand on this, but again, for the sake of time, we will not do it, three different definitions of the people. Sovereignty at the heart of the definition, class at the heart of the definition, national identity at the heart of the definition. Here we start to see some variants of neopopulism because we have variants in the definition of the people. So it's quite different, especially if you focus on class identity and sovereignty identity or sovereignty goals, if you're underlining one, if you're focusing on one of the two, uh, or if you're focusing on the other. And this is where we will see, we start talking increasingly about varieties of neopopulism. Let me give you an example. Trump, as a neopopulist leader, can be easily seen as someone that is focusing primarily on sovereignty goals, but to a certain extent also on a national identity. And please speak up if you think I'm saying something wrong. But I think we can easily agree on this. And again, we could be much more analytical, much more specific, but let's take it for the moment just as an example, an illustrative example. Whereas if we focus on Syriza in Greece or some other uh, 
populist parties, such as Podemos here in Spain and the evolution of Podemos in Spain, we had at the heart of the definition of the people something that was very different. It was not national identity, it was not sovereignty, but it was the fact that the people was based on a relationship that was grounded in class. And class could go beyond the borders. And here we have experiences of Podemos in government at the local level that show how the people could mean also including migrants, even uh, illegal migrants in uh, policy uh, provisions. So these differences actually do matter, not only in conceptual terms, but also in empirical and in policy terms. Yeah, let's, yeah. What about the elite? Now, the classic argument that was put forward by new populist parties when they were not in government was political elites suck, to be very, very uh, plain. Political elites, they've, they're corrupt. Uh, they are uh, um, taking away what we deserve. And not only the political national leagues, but also supranational leagues, if you take the European uh, stand, in particular the European Union, the International Monetary Fund, OECD, and many other organizations. But primarily the attack or the point of attack was elites are political. And we want to get but the power back to the people. We want to get it away from the elite because the elite are condemning the people to something that they should not be condemned to. Economic elites, big corporations, uh, multinationals, the rich, the 1% against the 99%, this is, by the way, a rhetoric that echoes very uh, nicely uh, the a rhetoric that was put forward by the global justice movement. But this is just food for thought for the discussion that you may have uh, at the end. Cultural elites, public uh, intellectuals, uh, those who actually uh, do uh, articulate ideas. There's anti-intellectualism very much at the heart of a number of populist attacks to politicians, to academics. Because making things complex is an elitistic way of uh, somehow making the people not obtain what they should have. It's a way to keep them away from power. It's a way to make things much more complex, more difficult than they actually should be. Common sense is something used as a keyword by populist leaders. The only thing you need in policies is common sense, which is, on the one hand, very simple to communicate. On the other hand, very difficult to translate what is common sense. But it's a way to get out the complexity of intellectuals that usually start their speeches by saying, reality is complex. Quite often when questions are asked to intellectuals, to professors, what's the answer? It depends, right? How many times have you, seen, have you heard this? It depends because there's the complexity to consider, to be considered. And therefore, it's not uh, easy to find either solution or to provide a straightforward option for policy action. Finally, social elites, <coughs> intermediaries are seen as enemies because they are once again making things more complex than they should be. Trade unions, business associations, they're sucking the blood of people. They're taking the blood away because they're somehow not doing anything, quote unquote, but taking advantage of those who are actually doing a lot of the people. So they're ripping off all the benefits that others should have to people. And civil society organizations also are quite often seen as enemies. This is in particular, uh, in particular true in those countries where some civil society organizations, for example, Hungary and Poland, are working very much uh, in order to avoid uh, ethnic uh, and um, linguistic uh, um, uh, minority accusations that sh are not, uh, should not be in line with democratic functioning of government. So to conclude this uh, uh, first part, and then we will go more on uh, the empirical side, why is it that we should talk about neo-populism and not populism? We already provide some answers, but let's be more analytical. For historical, for political, for economic and societal reasons, we have to make sure that we understand that today's phenomenon is very different from what it looked like in the 19th century, late 19th century. First of all, it was just, quote unquote, just one century and a half ago. A completely different world. 
It was not a democracy, not only in Russia, but even the United States. We could argue that, yes, we were, the United States was creating, was building a democracy, but for sure, it was not a uh, consolidated democracy as it is today. And I'm sure you, we do not need to expand on this, but in case uh, we can do it easily later. But this regards the US, uh, uh, of course, but regards uh, Russia as well, that was the other country where the phenomenon was actually developing in the second half of the 19th century. Very different economic settings. We had pre-industrial or industrial economies. Today, we're very much in a post-industrial or even a post-post-industrial economy. Completely different. Completely different because the economic roots of politics are different. And for this reason, we have to make sure that we get the picture right. And finally, the societal settings. Uh, you have, uh, you used to have agrarian societies in the second half of the 19th century, both in the US and in Russia. Today, most of uh, the um, democratic realities are very poorly agrarian and very much post-post-industrial with the societal consequences of this. Of course, if we take the world as a whole, then we do have some cases where we still have uh, agrarian societies. But as I said, we're going to primarily focus on uh, uh, democratic context and uh, quote unquote uh, advanced uh, democracies and therefore we do have very diff different societal settings today than what we used to have. So going more on the empirical side, we have varieties of neopontalism. Why do and how do we have varieties? Here I'm building on some uh, uh, work that has been done by some scholars uh, that are very well known in the field but also from my own work I've conducted a research together with uh, Mirto Sakatika at Glasgow University and Nuria Font at Autonoma, uh, Universidad Autonoma de Barcelona. And we were looking at three parties that came from Italy, Greece, and Spain. And we were trying to look at not only varieties of neopontalism, but varieties of inclusionary types of neopontalism. What's the difference between inclusionary and exclusionary? Uh, we have three key dimensions that have to be considered in order to understand the differences. The first one is the political dimension. For all neopopulist parties, increasing participation opportunities is key. The critique coming from neopopulism is representative democracy is a way for elites to suck the blood of the people. So we have to find alternatives. And both exclusionary and inclusionary neopopulist parties do look for alternatives. And the alternative is, let's increase modes of participation. Let's increase opportunities for participation. But here, the idea is that participation has to be granted to all in the inclusionary version. Everybody who is in a territory can be included and should be included in a participatory democratic process. Whereas in an exclusionary reading of the enhancement of participation, only some should participate. Who are the some? Who are those? And we link to the second uh, uh, dimension, those who are actually nationals, those who are natives, those who are part of the territory because extrema ratio, they are connected by generations to the territory. So only some can participate because the pure people is the nationals, is made up of nationals. Only those who actually not only have citizenship, but maybe, and this could be an extreme version of it, have been in that country, in that community for generations. We have not really gone that far yet, but this could be uh, uh, something that will happen. So also the identity is different. The people is uh, a universalistic concept covering all those who are part of a given territory for a, a, a given period of time against those who think that the people is a limited, the definition of people is only the nationals or those who share sovereignty goals having uh, uh, similar or rather the same uh, nationalities. And finally, and to a certain extent, one of the most important, if not the most important dimension, the material dimension, which is linked to uh, the allocation of uh, the policy benefits. Think about welfare. I'm sure that you all know what welfare policies are all about. Healthcare, pensions, employment, social assistance, housing, and so on. Well, when Trump used to say America first, it translated also into a number of policies that were trying to, if not entirely exclude, at least make life more difficult for those that were not natives, that were not locals. Just think about building a wall with reference to those who wanted to access the United States but actually uh, were uh, not 
allowed to in order uh, to avoid having other people, other individuals within a political community that could have wanted to benefit from the allocation or reallocation uh, of goods, policy goods, such as uh, welfare state policies. So in the inclusionary definition, everybody should be entitled to, for example, welfare benefits, all those who are, again, in a given territory in a given moment. Whereas in uh, exclusionary reading, only those who are the pure people, only those uh, who have been part of a given territory for generations are to be targeted by policies, in particular by distribution or a distributive or redistributive policies. And this applies to Trump, but of course applies to uh, a number of other uh, exclusionary um, neo-populist leaders or parties uh, throughout the uh, democratic world. Now, if we take some uh, empirical specifications and we focus on uh, countries that go beyond uh, the European Union and we focus on Latin America where populism has been very important for, uh, for decades, we do see, and this was one of the first findings of the literature, that inclusionary uh, um, neo-populism was much more present uh, in Latin America than it was in Europe. Actually, the first arguments were that inclusionary populism is, was Latin America, whereas exclusionary neo-populism was uh, uh, European. Well, it's not the case anymore, for sure, because we have had a number of inclusionary uh, neo-populist parties that developed over time that actually played a very different game in uh, the political world with respect to other political parties. So if we look at the differences that we have had in Europe over the, uh, the years, until or before 1994, we had, this is a, uh, again an empirical result of research conducted with Manuela Kayani and published in West European Politics. It was before we had other attempts to map uh, the varieties of neo-populism. We had a predominant um, uh, presence of exclusionary political parties, neo-populist political parties, 22 out of 23. So if we look at today's situation made of 66 parties, this is at the end of the 2000s, uh, one third roughly was uh, uh, founded before 1994 and the vast majority of the populist parties were exclusionary. Then we have a period when still exclusionary uh, parties uh, prevail, but we have some new inclusionary parties coming in. Uh, and again, we don't have time uh, to go much into the differences, but in Europe, this is a period when exclusionary uh, neo-populist parties are primarily coming from Central Eastern Europe. Why from Central Eastern Europe? Because as you all know, uh, after the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the redefinition of geopolitics within Europe, you had ent entirely new political systems that were built and that needed reason somehow to develop political conflicts. The best and easiest reason to develop was people against elite, and therefore elite was uh, roughly every single type of elite that we uh, referred to earlier. And this is where the story becomes even more interesting. After 2008, the situation changes. What happened in 2008? We all know. An international economic financial crisis that actually did trigger uh, a number of uh, um, opportunities for other types of parties to start playing a neo populist game. And these were inclusionary. So we still have a vast majority of exclusionary um, neo populist parties in uh, the European Union member states, plus another couple of countries that we considered. Um, but we have a slightly different picture that we have to acknowledge if we want to be accurate in the understanding of the function of neo-populism. Then we have other uh, definitions or readings of the, the varieties of neo-populism. This is, we do not have to go into uh, the uh, uh, definitions, but just to give you an idea of the varieties of readings of the varieties of neo-populism. We are intellectuals at the end, we're academic. We may be made things a bit too complex. In any case, we have a different stake, which is a different take, which is we have political parties, endorsed set of ideas, pure people, corrupt elite, nothing new. But then we have far right parties and far left parties that may become populist. So if we can go to the following slide, this is taken from populist.org. Uh, that is a website made uh, by a number of colleagues and researchers uh, that have tried to map uh, the uh, neo-populist parties and have provided uh, definitions based on experts 
uh, uh, reading of uh, the uh, various countries and various political parties. And what we do see is not only an expansion of the phenomenon over time, but uh, we have an expansion in particular of far-right populist parties and, to a certain extent, uh, growing relevance of far-left populist parties over time. Now, my, this is my reading of uh, this very uh, interesting and useful uh, other account. Uh, I would argue that if we're defining populism as a thin-centered ideology, it would be very difficult to consider the left and right as ideologies that can be associated to populist parties. Now, the argument that is put forward by those who do it is that you can uh, match ideologies. I would be conceptually a bit more Sartorian in this, saying that if you define a, a populism as a thin center, then it's thin centered. So it's inclusionary or exclusionary. It's not far right or far left, because the tension line is uh, quite different. Is being in or being out, to put it very simply being in the political system in terms of the material dimension, the political dimension, the symbolic dimension. But this may be food for thought uh, for later. So going towards the conclusion, and then finally uh, trying to address the issue, what about democracy? Here we have two main readings. One is, oh no, we have to be aware that neopopulism is going to kill democracy. After the uh, election of Trump, you had intellectual manifestos coming from various universities, departments of political science. In the US, they're starting to say, Trump is a risk for democracy. I was interested in reading, and clearly uh, there were some good arguments. But my point was, why should we be so scared in a context of a consolidated democracy? We're not speaking about Hungary. We're not speaking about Poland. We're speaking about the United States. And to a certain extent, although, it was a risky game at the end. Democracy held. Democracy was capable to resist to a somewhat present attack that was coming actually under the form of a threat. And we all remember some uh, images coming uh, from Washington uh, some uh, two years ago or so, or less than two years ago. So with this respect, uh, about two years ago, in this respect, uh, it may be a threat. And I will try to argue in this uh, uh, final uh, part of uh, my presentation that it is a, a threat in particular in those cases when democracy is not consolidated. And it's, again, we also start to have some empirical evidence. Uh, a very recent article that came out in the European Journal of Political Research does confirm uh, this reading. But it may also be a corrective. This is the alternative reading, which may be also a bit too naive if taken to the extreme. That is, you know, populism will save democracy. Why? because it will allow uh, individuals, members of the political community, to feel more attached to democracy because you have representatives that are voicing what people have to say. So as you see, we have two extremes. What uh, we need uh, to do is, again, be more nuanced. And therefore, first of all, distinguish between non-democratic regimes and democratic regimes to begin with, if we want to go towards a theory of neopopulism. But we also have to introduce the notion in a much more systematic, systematic way, we have to introduce the notion of crisis and the performance of a crisis by neo-populist uh, um, uh, political leaders. Um, because as we will see in just a second, mobilizing over a crisis can allow neo-populist leaders to be successful, but also then once in government, neo-populist leaders will have to cope with the rules of the game. And if the democracy is solid, then uh, it will be shaken maybe, but it will not change necessarily. If the democracy is not very solid, it may change. And this is the case of Hungary and to a certain extent of Poland. If it's a non-democratic regime, it will become even more a non-democratic regime. But let's, before we get to the, the final slides, let's remind ourselves that the crises are numerous today. Uh, scholars are uh, talking about a perma-crisis or a polycrisis context. The classic crises are the political uh, one, the economic one, the cultural one. Political losing legitimacy of the regime, political distrust, and we have lots of data. Uh, although a very recent book by Larry Bartels does introduce some uh, uh, criticism there, we again, I, I haven't had time to read the book, I bought it, I cannot 
get into the details, but if for sure if we speak for the Italian and for a number of European countries that I know empirically, we have had a decline in the support for democracy with all indicators you could consider since the uh, second half of, the first half of the 80s. So it's not something very new, it's something that has eroded democracy and then, this is my view, when political entrepreneurs mobilize over this specific crisis or cleavage, then the um, neo-populist uh, recipe became very successful. It can be economic crisis, again, no need to expand on this, or also a cultural crisis, especially in terms of identity that may be uh, um, threatened by uh, migrants. This is the reading of some neo-populist leaders saying, we need to protect ourselves, America first, Italy first, and so on, because we need to maintain our traditions, our peculiarities, and not become too mixed. And this is somehow the grand finale. If we take the crisis and interaction uh, among the various crises, and we look at some facilitating factors that are political leadership styles and media innovations that enhanced the capacities of uh, neo-populist leaders to actually be very effective, we may have different outcomes with reference to the function of democracy. In authoritarian and or liberal democratic uh, regimes, we would have a consolidation of the regime, of the non-democratic uh, regime. So, Russia, Putin, Erdogan in Turkey, and many other cases, you become increasingly populist and you try to increasingly, thanks to this, uh, maintain power, and you actually manage to do that. Because you are becoming even more exclusionary. Here we're talking about an exclusionary type of neo-populism, by the way. In democratic neo-populist uh, countries which are non-consolidated democracies, for example, Hungary, Poland, then you may have a regime change that is going from a democratic regime to a non-democratic one. And this is exactly the trajectory that has happened over the past uh, 13 years in Hungary. And you can see it very nicely or dramatically, it depends on how you read it. But in 13 years, you had democratic erosion from the top, Orban, the leader of, uh, of Hungary, putting together a number of policies that were eroding the separation of powers, were eroding pluralism, were eroding the capacity of the system to uh, protect uh, minorities' rights. So actually, it is a threat, to, to say it very simply. Neopopulism may be a threat to democracy, but in some specific cases. Which cases? Those cases where democracy is not solid yet. In other cases, I would argue that instead it re-articulates the regime. And this is the European story that we have had so far. To a certain extent, I would argue, but I would like to hear your thoughts, it's also the US story. You may like or not like Trump, but at the end of the day, some topics, some issues have become more central in the agenda thanks to the fact that you had a political representative trying to voice some concerns that other politicians were not voicing. And this is, once again, clearly the case of a number of European countries where, for example, poverty uh, has become even more crucial uh, in the polit political agendas. And here, just one reference, direct reference to Italy. Uh, the neo-populist government of 2018 was the first government to introduce a poverty alleviation measure that was actually uh, targeted in an exclusionary way because not everybody could access, but it was an example of regime rearticulation thanks to policies that allowed some of the concerns of the people, in this specific case, millions of poor people, to be considered by the politicians, new politicians. So I will, for the moment, stop here and leave the floor to you or to Sophia, of course. Thank you. Well, let's applaud you first. <laughs> Thank you, Paula. That was a very stimulating um, talk, raising a lot of questions, I think. Uh, let me see if there are people in the audience who have questions, and if not, I will start with one of my own. OK, so we do have, uh, we'll start with Julia, and then Jack. And Daniela. Daniela, okay. Um, I have a question because when you were talking about um, like after the populism, there was a lot of um, the, the, the corrupt elite. Um, and now I have a specific example in, in mind, Poland, um, where in 2013 and 2014 there were the recordings that targeted the Liberal Party, and now there's like. Party are suing Donald Trump and everything. 
Um, how do how does a populist party target a, a, a corrupt elite, but then when they are corrupt and you have journalists publish stories that they're corrupt, the public still trusts them? Right. This is where the, I'll take one by one. If this is uh, yes, okay, that's yeah. Fine. So thank you for the question, Julia. Yeah, uh, that's where the communication style comes in and the capacity to produce specific narratives that underplay the role of corruption for the newly corrupt people. So uh, my understanding is that uh, on the one hand, you have decades of corruption, or this is the narrative. You have in corrupt political systems, not only pol corrupt leaders, but you have corrupt political systems. And this is very powerful as a, a, a a way to attack the politicians that have been in charge for policies for a number of decades. On the other hand, if you have a scandal, of course, it's a problem, and we will try not to have it. If you have a corruption scandal, you have to deal with it. But the argument, the rhetorical argument is said, this happened only once, it's, I'm, the leader for, per se is not necessarily responsible, or it's fake news. And the, the argument is made also thanks to social media where you have very limit, limited opportunity for uh, other opinions to be included because basically it's a bi bilateral relationship where I, ha I am the truth. I'm speaking in the social media. What I say is the truth. And you take it as it is. So you have campaigns, very powerful campaigns that are trying to support the narrative. And since on the other side, you have decades of corrupt elites that actually cannot say we are really the pure, the pure ones, not you that are pretending to be the pure, then it's still very effective. But it will not last long. I, I see your point in the sense that, uh, take another example, Berlusconi. At the beginning, it was very plausible and understandable that he said, I'm new. There's something new about my way of doing politics. Uh, the political elites are corrupt because they're, or they're not successful in other businesses. I'm successful as an entrepreneur. I do not need to be corrupt, actually, I'm going to uh, sacrifice my properties, my businesses, because I want to save Italy. It's a very powerful rhetoric. 30 years later, with a number of scandals that occurred, also uh, with reference to the management of funds or to corruption issues, it's much less easy to do that. And by the way, the Berlusconi's party today is residual. Still important, but residual. But you had other neo-populist leaders that played the same cards. So Meloni and Salvini uh, took um, the benefits of that discourse. So my reading in the Polish, of the Polish case could be that if the corruption uh, event is not re replicated in the future, then it may simply, thanks to the narrative that is very powerfully supported by the political uh, uh, neo-populist leadership, then you can survive. But if it continues, just like in the Czech Republic with Babish, you disappear. Babish, for the moment, has disappeared. Explicitly because he was not credible anymore. He was very powerful for a decade, but then didn't manage to continue because he was accused of bribery and a number of other things. Jack, I think? Yeah, uh, yeah. so um, you mentioned how uh, you believe that exclusionary versus inclusionary is the best identifier when considering the populist in center ideology. Um, I understand how that's like the best for identifying like, the base of each movements like um, for example like um, the climate change group like you could say like affects all people no matter how like, you cut it but yet when you compare like far left and far right these very like different like standpoints in terms of uh, social issues right this is a very good point um, if you look at policies you could argue that both far left and far right and inclusionary exclusionary could uh, be good identifiers um, why? Because also in the inclusionary, inclusionary version, in an inclusionary reading of the people, you would be in favor of uh, climate ch change mitigation or uh, of uh, the uh, reduction uh, of climate alteration. Because the world is the people. Whereas if exclusionary say, well, we want our cars, we want to be protected, so even if we do something, others should not benefit from what we're doing, and therefore climate the climate change is actually not that relevant at the end of the day. We can continue to live our lives. This is a far right, but it's also an exclusionary argument at the same time. So I'm not saying that you cannot read the current political reality uh, using uh, both lenses. 
But if you're losing the neopopulist, if you're using the neopopulist lenses, in my view, you should stick to the definition. And then you have some challenges coming from the policy field that is, what does inclusionary and exclusionary mean, for example, with reference uh, to climate, to climate change? What does it mean with reference uh, to the welfare state? Well, to the welfare state, it's very clear. So you want more welfare, but only for some. This is the exclusionary reading. If you take the far right and far left, they both would be more in favor for welfare for some, in some cases. If you think about, for, again, I don't want to go too much into the examples, but the German case of Die Linke is very interesting because you had a split in Die Linke where the neo-populist trend was somehow challenged by those who said, no way, we don't want migrants. I'm exaggerating a bit. We do, not, we do not want welfare for migrants. We want it for working class, the German working class. This is very much far left or far right politics. It could be far right or far left, but you do not understand that anymore if you use far left and far right. You understand it if you think in terms of inclusionary, exclusionary. That was an exclusionary uh, redefinition of an inclusionary position. Because from a policy perspective, it made sense you had workers that were challenged, quote unquote, in their welfare benefits by migrants that had an asylum uh, seeking status that in their reading was reducing the benefits that the real Germans could obtain. And this was taken from Die Linke. It was not alternative for Deutschland. It is the uh, far right and exclusionary neo-populist political party. So the point is very well taken indeed. And I think this is one of the points where we do need uh, further research to see if actually the exclusionary inclusionary tension line holds for all uh, the uh, the situation that we may encounter. But if you if we take it uh, uh, seriously, I do think that it makes more sense. It's more uh, it allows us to understand better what's happening uh, than if we just took the far left and far right, because left and right have so different meanings uh, that uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult, in my view, to uh, read politics uh, in this way. Sir, you didn't get Daniela. Daniela. Uh, thank you for this. I have a page of questions, <laughs> which I will not go through right now. But my last, my question is actually going to go to your last point about regime rearticulation. I was curious to hear a little bit more about that, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Because even as I'm listening to your presentation and thinking about what's happening in Europe, I wonder if it's a regime rearticulation or a party regime rearticulation a rearticulation of the electoral system that has been simmering uh, for at least 20, if not 30 years, right? And I, I, I'm sort of thinking here, you know, as the center left and the center right sort of coalesce on economic policy across Europe, and even in the United States, you know, under the Clinton years, right? But I'm thinking of a Blair, I'm thinking of a Schroeder, right? The Neue Mittel, the New Middle, et cetera. They coalesce on neoliberal policies that led to the creation of the Single European Act and all of those policies that then came into a crisis in 2008, right? And thus delegitimized the parties, sort of buy in into this economic model and helped create this opening, right? For all of this neo-populist movements on the right and on the left, whatever way we want to classify them, but to sort of take advantage of that cycle of contention to say, hey, we need to completely reorganize and rethink the party system because there's no real difference at the center anymore, right? And some of them want to save the welfare system, some of them want to save it, but only for some people, right? Um, so anyway, I just wanted to, for you to comment on that because regime rearticulation to me sounds like you're talking about the democratic regime itself rearticulating itself and I wonder how much of that is not just the electoral system rearticulating itself, not going to a critical juncture that gets speed up, sped up after 2008 and leads to the emergence of these new parties who are forming new electoral coalitions uh, of you know, voters that uh, either were disenfranchised or uh, were not active, uh, connecting very wealthy with very poor you know, uh, votes under the same, I'm talking too much. 
No, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, what I would uh, consider a regime of articulation does include um, politics. But as, again, if we have time, the other slides show, it's also about polity and policies. This is why it's about the political system altogether. It's not only about how the political games are played, but also about which policies are selected or produced. And also, uh, what are the definitions of citizenships in the given context? So not only you have more representation in line with uh, the expectations of the potential voters. Uh, let me just be a bit more specific here. What, one of the trends of uh, the political, one of the indicators of the political crisis have been the contraction of uh, uh, the voting population in European countries. And Italy is uh, particularly telling in this respect. So, we have evidence that supports, uh, um, quite robustly, not everywhere, uh, that thanks to the neo-populist parties, people went back to, the, uh, uh, to vote. So this is only one. Then policies changed, but it's a re-articulation in the sense, not simply in terms of new parties obtaining votes or new political leaders uh, um, becoming central in the political system. Thanks to this, there are some uh, effects uh, that are triggered by this change that re regard also the nature of, of, of the democratic system, for example, enhancing or trying to enhance participatory democracy. For example, participatory budgeting at the local level was one of uh, the key elements supported by uh, the Five Star Movement uh, in Italy that initially was uh, more inclusionary than is a bit hybrid now. It's a bit, a bit more mixed. But we do have changes that are not simply connected to party competition. This is why we still continue to call it regime articulation. Yeah. My, my, my name is Alberto. Thank Alberto. you for your presentation. Thank you. My question is a little bit more overarching, going back to the general idea of this presentation. So it's a very basic question, but I think it really does need a little bit more discussion on your part, putting a little bit of pressure on the idea of going into the nuances of neo-populism and populism. From the point of legislation, from a congressperson, if you sat them down and I was a congressperson and you gave me this presentation. I'd be like, that's fantastic that we're going over the, the nuances of neo-populism and populism. And to your point, the main concern is that there are different historical contexts with different, with different meanings. Do you have anything beyond just that? Because when you look at, regardless, there's always charged language and they're always going to slant. And by they, I mean the people, the political leaders. They're always going to slant it in such a way that it's always for the people. So why, why does it, I'm, Again, very basic question, but why does it, and, and I understand we have this entire presentation, but in, in one sense it's beyond this, that there's different historical contexts and meanings. Is there something that you can say that makes it more compelling to even understand or go into a very deep uh, nuance of neo-populism versus populism? Sure, because it's not only, a, thanks for the question, it's not only a historical uh, element to be considered, but it's also an economic setting, the political setting, and the societal setting, so the demands coming from the political community are different. So if I had to speak, for example, to a democratic uh, congressman, that because on the right, quote unquote, or on the Trump side, on the Republican side, they understood it very clearly. Nobody wanted Trump within, or I'm exaggerating a bit, but within the Republican world, Trump was a surprise for the Republican world as well. But Trump understood perfectly what a neo-populist leader should look, look like. He most likely did not even know what the uh, people's party was, right? So that story is not relevant for today's politicians. Today's politicians, of course, will always speak in name of the people, but they can speak in name of the people or try to speak in name of the people without naming the people as such and without creating a new identity. This is what the MAGA movement has been doing. Make America great again, America first, this is creating a common identity. It's not just working for the people. It's much, much, much more. This is why it's so important to see the differences. That it's not only difference between populism and neopopulism, but it's the difference between making politics in a different way. Take, again, Clinton, Trump. Just think about the ways through which the people was defined. Both, in your, your argument, were defending the people. But the way through which the people were defined was completely different, much more in line with what was happening in some states, in particular the Trump version, 
much more superficial to Clinton's reading. So with this respect, it's not simply about historical settings that change, <coughs> but it's the entire political game that changes. Preferences are different, demands are different, uh, tools in order to obtain support are different, the procedures are different. This is why uh, even today, if I was not targeting an academic audience, which I'm currently targeting, I would target, if I had to target a, a policymaker audience, I would just start out with that. Of course, I would not spend more than one minute because I, I would not have the, the, the luxury of speaking 45 minutes in front of policymakers. I would have five minutes. So the first minute would be, okay, take this, let's move on. But if ever a politician would say, hey, let's go back to that, I would do it gladly. But it would be the point of departure, not the point of arrival. I would argue that exclusionary uh, neopopulism is, uh, whereas inclusionary populism may not be. But what we actually do not seem to find is the presence of inclusionary neopopulist movements in non-consolidated democracies, if we look at Europe. If you look at Latin America, it's a different story, but I'm not a Latin American expert, so I would not go into the details. But uh, for sure, exclusionary neopopulist leaders in non-democratic regimes are a threat. And uh, it depends on the capacity of the opposition and on the capacity also of also international actors. Take the European Union and Hungary. Uh, as you know, the, the rule of law and more broadly speaking, uh, the uh, traits of the Hungarian democracy are uh, under uh, discussion uh, within the European Union. And you have uh, Orban that actually is obtaining some support from others also by the Italian government in order to contrast this narrative. But that's the classic example of an exclusionary neo-populist party that is uh, putting at risk democracy. And my argument is that in any non-consolidated democracy, the risk is very high. It may not be, there's nothing automatic in politics, conditions have to be there, but then they have to be mobilized somehow by political leaders in order to actually go in one direction. But yes, it would be a, a very high risk with exclusionary political neo-populist parties, much less so with inclusionary, but we do not have those many in non-consolidated democracies. So we have one more question from the audience and then I will throw one in and I think then our time will be up. Yes, Charles. Oh, hello, oh, Charlie. Um, can I ask, um, what is the role of charismatic authority in populism? And can populism exist without that central figure? Like when we talk about populist movements, sometimes we mention parties, but primarily it's the Trump, the Lula, the Netanyahu, right? Those central figures as the vehicles of populism. Well, thank you very much for this question. Actually, it would uh, give birth to a, a second presentation that I will not do, but I'm working exactly on the political leadership styles. Uh, I'm, I have a number of issues with the definition of charismatic because it's very difficult to empirically uh, translate it into uh, indicators that you may, uh, you may, uh, you may uh, identify in order to see if beyond the, this journalistic discourse, it, what's charisma? How do we define charisma? Uh, there is this empathetic political leadership style that has been identified in the literature that I find more uh, useful. Uh, what is empathetic can be, I think, better measured because it's uh, identification with between the leader and the people that can be somehow empirically uh, 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 identified. So with this respect, uh, we don't only have, this would be the answer, we do not, not only have empathetic uh, political leadership styles, we also have bureaucratic ones. And Macron is a very good example of a neo-populist leader that is playing a completely different game in France. Or Berlusconi at the beginning, yes, he had some empathetic, em some empathy was there. But if you look at what he said in 1994 in his first uh, uh, speech that was a video that he sent, up, uh, sent out to all of the media at the time, 1994, you were not even here, but at the time it was very original in Italy. Political marketing did not exist. He sent out this video, and in 10 minutes, 
the first one minute and a half is what counts. And the first one minute and a half, he doesn't say, I'm like you. He's not apathetic at all. He's saying, I'm going to save you. It's, it was not yet the Trumpian rhetoric. It was, I'm going to save you because I know what to do. I know how to solve problems. I'm a problem solver, a bit like Mr. Wolf in Pulp Fiction, if you have seen the movie, right? I'm the problem solver because I know how to do it. So trust me, not because I'm you. This is more Trump and many others. But trust me because I've been a successful entrepreneur, a successful father, a successful son, and everything else that makes that leadership style much more bureaucratic. And then finally, we have another type of uh, political leadership style, which is the participatory style. The source is making people count more, not because we are the same, but because we have to be together. And this is Grillo in the Five Star Movement uh, in, uh, in Italy when the Five Star Movement was launched at the end of the 2000s. So the answer is not only empathetic political leadership styles can be found in neo-populist leaderships. So I will take um, my right as the moderator to ask the right to the last question. And um, I think I would, I, this is my question. Um, do you think that in the kind of core um, principle of society, of there being an antagonistic relationship between uh, the people at large and the elites, and, and that, that relationship being the reason for the crisis also, generally speaking, the reason why there is a crisis is because the elite that you have is not serving you well, uh, and it must be replaced, that there is also a kind of a, a denial of pluralism necessarily among the people. And um, is that denial of pluralism not of itself kind of dangerous to the notion of a liberal democracy? This would be uh, Werner's and Urbinati's argument, mm -hmm. um, which I uh, somehow do not subscribe entirely because it, if you take a reading of the people as a unitary set of individuals, uh, and therefore all those who are not within the definition of people uh, have to be somehow put, become the, the, the outsiders, those who have to be put outside of the political system, then there could be this danger. But since in reality, empirically, uh, you do have this reading of the people and therefore minorities uh, uh, somehow uh, may be actually not debit, not considered as they tend to be in democracies. But the point is that political systems are changing as they never have changed in the past. The migration phenomenon is something entirely new. Just think about the development of the welfare state. The welfare state, by definition, was for nationals, was for those who were within the political system in a globalized world where you have migration flows that change completely the spectrum. Now, even non-neopopulist parties play the same uh, anti-pluralistic game. If you take pluralism as a guarantee for all those who are within a given country, not necessarily within the political system. That's, I think, the biggest uh, uh, normative issue for the future. It's not neopopulist leaders that are changing the game because neopopulist discourses are discourses that tra mainstream political parties have wanted to be doing but never did because they were scared to do and now they're doing them. So if you had the difference, then you would have mainstream parties not playing the neo-populist game. But what you actually have is a populistization of mainstream political parties. So yes, it is a danger, but it's not a danger that is linked to the only to the political entrepreneurship laid by neo-populist leaders. But it's linked to the fact that the political systems are so uh, changeable now in terms of the, the population that may be part of the political system. This is the real challenge for all political parties in the future, for democracies in the future, who is in and who's out in general. Then not, uh, politically speaking, that is what the politicians would like to see in and what they would like to see out. OK, well, I know some of you have to run off to another class. So thank you so much. Thank you again.